Are there unintended consequences of treating eye floaters with a laser? Well, I'm glad you asked, because yes, there are. I've talked separately about actual risks, risks to the retina and lens and eye pressures. Uh, we'll leave that aside for now. I'm talking about the unintended consequence of treating your floater and then having it reform. Hi, I'm Dr. James Johnson. I'm medical director of Vitreous Floater Solutions, also known as the Floater Doctor. All I do is treat eye floaters in my medical practice in Southern California and I have been doing so exclusively since 2007. So we're going to talk about reformation floaters. First, we're going to talk about, well, what is the vitreous and, and what's going on there? And this will help explain it. So over here, I have a little schematic. Uh, these dark curved lines here are to represent the collagen proteins, which are long-stranded proteins. Now remember, proteins are not the same thing as living, breathing cells. These uh, proteins are produced by cells. And so these uh, proteins are of a, a small percentage, about 1%. And by the way, it's not just collagen. There's also hyaluronic acid. It's kind of a fancy sugar. And so uh, the collagen and the hyaluronic acid together make up about 1%. The rest of it is water. So the vitreous is actually a pretty bland, probably the least interesting volume tissue or space, uh, not just within the eye, but of the entire body. There isn't much going on here. It's fairly inert. And interestingly enough, we don't have a factory in the eye making more of these proteins throughout your lifetime. Essentially, the proteins that you have are the proteins you were born with and the proteins that developed during your embryological development. So we should have a set amount of proteins. The thing is, there's nowhere for them to go. Uh, and within the eye, there's no innate natural uh, cleansing, turnover, production, drainage. There's no turnover as there is with uh, older or dying cells. Uh, and the pro these proteins are there stuck with it. Now, we have these long-stranded proteins. There's some cross-linking, which gives a little bit of gel-like stability, uh, surrounded mostly by water. The hyaluronic acid is thought to perhaps coat the collagen because collagen is naturally sticky. It wants to cling to each other. And so the hyaluronic acid may act as a repellent or maybe think of it as like a nonstick coating. So when all is good and well and measured in decades, five, six, seven decades, whatever, uh, for most people, uh, this small amount of collagen and hyaluronic acid remains stable in that vitreous space and all is good in vitreous land. It, it's clear, the light just passes right through it. You don't see floaters, everybody's happy. The problem is with time, with age, uh, who knows what else, inflammation, oxidation, uh, dietary, who knows, mostly it's just aging probably, there might be a breakdown of that hyaluronic acid. And so if you don't no longer have the non-stick coating, these sticky proteins will tend to stick and aggregate. And once they stick and aggregate, they don't want to unstick and unaggregate. So you're left with all these proteins that start to aggregate and aggregate. So uh, what can happen then is you can get the floaters that form in this space right here. And um, that's where our floaters are. So that's kind of the basic and, and, the, and the background. And uh, let me erase this. Let me come over here. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how the laser works and how we get the reformation. Okay, so now we're here at the schematic of the eye, and let's just put a little something in there. Something small, something dense. This might represent, uh, after a posterior vitreous detachment, this vitreous has separated here, and you have a particularly dense floater, probably a variant of a Weiss ring. And let's say you go in there with the laser and you break that thing up, you've destroyed those proteins, those are not coming back. And a posterior vitreous detachment, by definition, is a one-time event. So that's only happened once. You destroy that, it's gone, doesn't come back, you don't have more of those, they're not reforming, everything's great. Now, what if in contradistinction we have a larger, heavier, denser, cloudier floater, something that's much larger like this? Because it's called a cineresis floater, it's cloudier and it doesn't absorb the laser energy quite as well. You can still break that up, and you do, and you know, after that initial treatment, you might have some pretty good initial results. The patient might say, you know, by the evening, by the evening of that first treatment, oh my gosh, it's so much better. I haven't seen this well in 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 years. You know, if they've had this thing for a long time. But um, because it's less efficient, you probably are getting a lot of microscopic debris kind of scattered out here. And I've mentioned this in a different video, 
Uh, the one where we're concerned about elevated eye pressures, where this debris can get into the front of the eye and gunk up that, that drainage system there. The problem with this is now you have scattered microscopic fragments. And by the way, you're not seeing these as individual floaters. I, I, have, to, I have to put something there. These are microscopic and you're not going to see them. But they are sticky and they have a tendency to reform and re-aggregate. So, and this happens fairly quickly, you know, even in the first 24 hours or so. So uh, when the patient comes back the next day, if we're scheduled for that, they'll come back and they might have something new that tends to be this kind of fuzzy, thin, a uh, wispy little, fuzzy little, strandy little floater. It might be, you know, something kind of sort of represented as something like that. Now, compared to its original appearance, I would argue that that is a lot less material than what we started off with, right? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a thin little skinny little strand as compared to a larger, literally obstructive uh, cloud. So they're not getting obstruction or intermittent obstruction of their vision, but they've got this annoying little, you know, little strand that's whipping around all over there. So I'll agree that that could be really quite bothersome. So what do you do with that? Well, you have to go in and treat that. So you might go in on day number two and break that up to your best of your ability. And by the end of the procedure, I might be you know, busy patting myself on the back saying, good job, Dr. Johnson. Uh, it's looking really, really good in there. And if the patient is scheduled for another day or they might go back home and message me or email me and say, you know, Dr. Dr. Johnson, it's, it's a lot, lot better. But there's this little, little strand that, that I'm still seeing there and kind of whips around in there. Yeah, you know, sorry, it's, you know, that is even better than the one just before that. So we are breaking this stuff down, but there is that tendency for them to reform. It is frustrating. It is, it is the bane of my practice. I don't know if there's any particular settings of the laser, energy levels, aggressive versus conservative. I don't know if there's anything to really be able to pre prevent that. Now, this is not a complication. It's an unintended uh, consequence, but it's not a complication. There's no damage to the retina. There's no damage to the lens. There's no eye pressure problems. So in that sense, it's not a, um, a, a, a complication that affects the eye health or the eye function. You just got some residual stuff. This underscores the general inefficiency of the process. You know, I wish it were a one and done or one and two and done. I don't get to enjoy the efficiency uh, of treatment um, and certainty of completion that say, for instance, a cataract surgeon does. You know, a cataract surgeon, when they're done with the procedure, they can go through their mental checklist and say, you know, the, the cataract is out, the new lens is in, uh, everything is tidied up, it's perfect, uh, there were no complications, I am 100% done. I don't get to enjoy that. Everything that I do is on a spectrum, a sliding scale spectrum, and that's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, a lot of what I do is educational, which this is what I'm doing. It's education, right? You're learning about uh, floaters. A lot of this also is management of expectations. I spend a lot of time managing people's expectations because uh, my reputation matters. I don't want to be perceived as luring people in with amazing promises, of uh, you know one treatment that's all it takes it's easy peasy and by the way I have seen this on some of the other websites uh, where the doctors are buying the laser they're like well, I, I'll, I, I treat floaters now because I have the laser they've been told that the laser that it's a laser that treats floaters the laser do, does not treat floaters the doctor treats floaters so when I go and check out my competitors website and they have a a paragraph or a couple sentences something along the lines of it's easy peasy in office uh, quick and easy, you know, I see stuff like that. I'm like, they don't have any experience because this stuff is just, it just happens. It just is. So usually you can work through that. You know, eventually there's just less and less of that protein substrate available to reform. Um, and when all is said and done, you know, there's still, it's still going to be imperfect. You know, talking about expectations, uh, the end point of treatment, a successful treatment is a lot, lot better, not perfection. You know, although I'm trying for 100%, I don't want anybody to ever expect that this is going to be returned to crystal clear spring water or, you know, the quality of the vitreous when you were 13 years old. It just doesn't happen like that. But if I can make this a lot, lot better, the largest obstructive floater is gone, anything that remains is just sort of minor and small and yeah, just kind of back to what we might say normal age-related floaters, we're probably doing okay. That's a reasonable expectation. So... I guess that, in a nutshell, is the is the reformation. It all depends on the type of floater. You know, um, there are certain floaters where I can look in there and I can say, "This is good because you know it's not going to reform. We don't have to worry about eye pressure problems. This type of floater is very efficiently treated. It's a Weiss ring, whatever. It's something like that." 
Um, I love those. I just don't get them nearly as often as I would like. I get a lot more complicated stuff. I am the floater doctor, and I have patients coming to me from all over the world uh, to get their floaters treated. And as much as I would like to cherry pick and have the easy ones walk in my door, I get the worst of the worst from all over the world, and that's okay. That's how I build my reputation. And, uh, and I've been doing this since 2007 exclusively. I got a lot of practice. So uh, I can recognize these sayings. I can tell you at the time of consultation kind of what to expect. And um, you know, we can discuss whether treating with the laser is even appropriate. You know, If there's so much stuff and you live in some other country, um, you know, it might still be worth trying with the laser. Sometimes I'll say, you know, maybe the surgical vitrectomy might be a better choice for you. And they'll still tell me they'd rather try the laser first, and we will. And uh, even with some of these complex ones, some of these massively large complex floaters, sometimes you can still get really, really good results if you just hunker down, dig in, and go after it, shot after shot after shot after shot, and do that uh, several hundred times or so. So anyways, that's kind of, a, a, again, a summary of uh, reformation. I hope that answers some questions that people have had about that. I go over it in my consultation, I'm going over it again. I uh, hope you learned a little something. 